welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time we're going to build a silent PC using this ASRock Mini ITX motherboard with an N100 processor. The project is an upgrade of the computer on which I run Linux Mint and do most of my computing activity aside from video production. The current version of the machine was built in January 2014 and has an i3-4330T CPU. But I'd now like to make it totally silent and also more energy efficient. So let's go and get started. Right, here we have our motherboard, which is an ASRock M100 DC ITX that comes with an N100 CPU pre-installed. I managed to purchase this for £123.46 including taxes from TechImage in the UK and I've also found it on Newegg for $129.99. The DC in the name is significant as it indicates that this has to be powered by an external 19 volt power supply. However, ASRock also sell an alternative micro ATX board called the N100M that has standard ATX power connectors. And there's a similar ATX powered mini ITX N100 board from ASUS called the Prime M100i DD4. However, for my purposes, I like the idea of a silent power supply outside of the main case. So let's open this up very, very simple unboxing, just uh, like that. There we are. And oh, look, we have a paper manual. Don't always get those these days. And we have, um, this is a SATA power cable. We did this because of the way the board is powered. We'll look at that later. We have an IO shield. We'd expect that for the back of the case. We have um, M.2 screws, I think those are. And we have some standard uh, SATA leads. But uh, the most important bit, of course, is under here and uh, here it is, there it is, here is our board. Oh, it's always exciting opening a new motherboard, particularly when it's gonna be a daily driver. Very exciting new motherboard. Let's take this and put it down over here. As we can see, for silent operation, we have a heatsink without a fan, and under here is our N100 processor, just like those found in many mini PCs. The N100 was released in early 2023, and it's a 13th generation Intel CPU with four efficient or E cores clocked at up to 3.4 gigahertz. And we also have Intel UHD graphics with 24 execution units. Also on the top of the board, we find a single slot for a DDR4 memory module. And it's worth noting that the M100 only supports one channel of RAM so we only have one slot. And normally an M100 is limited to 16 gigabytes of RAM, although here, if we want to, we can fit 32 gigabytes of RAM. In addition, we have a PCIe slot, and this is a four lane PCIe 3.0. And we also have a 2230 E keyed M.2 slot for a wireless module, as well as a 2280 M keyed M.2 slot that supports the NVMe SSD. And the connectivity here is PCIe 3.0 two lane, so the theoretical maximum data transfer speed is 16 gigabits per second. And whilst this is slow compared to most modern PC motherboards, it's still over two and a half times faster than SATA 3. Talking of which, we do have two six gigabit per second SATA 3 ports and alongside them a SATA power connector for the lead we saw earlier. Other connectivity on top of the board includes headers for two USB 3 ports, two USB 2 ports, the front panel, and even an LPT or line print terminal parallel port. And we also have headers for two case fans, one of them down here, although I won't be connecting anything to these in this silent build. Turning to the back panel, we find a barrel jack that accepts the 19 volt input required to power the board, as well as four USB 2 ports, a PS2 keyboard or mouse connector, and gigabit ethernet. Next to that, we then find a VGA connector that supports up to 1920 by 1080 at 60 frames a second, and below it, an HDMI connector that supports up to 4K, also at up to 60 frames a second. 
Finally, we find a D sub serial port, two USB 3 ports, and three 3.5mm audio jacks. And so there we are the ASRock N100DC ITX, the basis of a silent, energy efficient mini ITX desktop PC. So, to turn our N100 motherboard into a functional computer, here we have some RAM, a system drive and a power supply. Specifically, we've got an 8GB Corsair Vengeance DDR4 DIMM, and I did have a bit of a job finding one of these. You normally buy these in pairs, but uh, I managed to get this single 8GB DDR4 DIMM from Quiet PC for £20.90, which is about $26.55. For our system drive, we've got, as you can see, a Samsung Evo, Samsung 970 Evo Plus to be specific, 2TB SSD, and this is a very decent PCIe 3.0 NVMe SSD with 2GB of SDRAM cache. And given that our motherboard has got a PCIe 3.0 M.2 slot, there's no point me spending more money to get a PCIe 4.0 drive. Finally, I chose this Asaka 19 volt 65 watt power supply, again from Quiet PC. This cost me a £25.20, that's about $32. And without doubt, I could have bought a much cheaper 19 volt power supply, but I really wanted to buy one from a manufacturer who I trusted to sell me something that uh, wasn't likely to cause a fire. So let's bring in Stanley the Knife and open up the memory. Normally easier to open these up at the bottom, I think, but I always struggle, don't I? As I have done there, I've got in finally, found the memory, and here it is, our lovely uh, piece of uh, RAM. So let's get this uh, out of its packaging, like uh, that, and we will now uh, fit this in the computer, like this. There we go. And if we repeat our unboxing trick with the uh, SSD, I do like SSDs, as you know, they're always hard to get into though, because they do all sorts of things to stop you getting into SSDs these days. There we are, I think that's gonna let us in. Yes, it is, oh yes, that's right. Come on, come out, come out, wherever you are. Here we are, our Samsung Evo Plus. I forgot to tell you the price of this, didn't I? I paid £121.80, and you can buy this drive for $119 on Amazon.com. Anyway, let's now fit it in the computer. Here we go, by the magic of filmmaking, everything is uh, proceeding at uh, an accelerated pace. Let's just put in the screw, one of those, there's a little bag in the, uh, the box, put that down there like that. There we are, and lo and behold, we now have the guts of a functional computer. Greetings! It's now time to fit the new system into the case, which I've now got here on the workbench, as you can see. And the system drive at the moment is actually a SATA 2.5 inch drive, and it's fitted in this bay, so I need to take that out like that. And if I then grab this to screwdriver, I can start taking everything apart. There we go. We are inside, and as usual, in a Mini-ITX case, things are slightly crowded, so uh, I'm going to get on with uh, taking everything apart, including taking out the power supply. And there we are, down to the motherboard. It's much more likely now we can get things in, doesn't it? But, oh dear, we've dropped a cable tie in there. That's a bad thing. But uh, will I be able to get the motherboard out without having to move all this metal? I don't know. Possibly. Let's have a go. And uh, as you can see, I forgot, we've got a PCIe sound card. I don't think that's going back in, although uh, we could do. We have got a slot, but anyway, that comes out for now. How did this come out? Because this is part of the case. There must be a way to get this thing out. I must have got it in. But uh, it's a tight fit. It's a tight, tight fit. And uh, I think I've got to release that, haven't I? And there we are, 
we have an empty case. The old i3 has come out. And uh, I need to get out the, uh, the back panel, the I.O. shield. There we are. That will need replacing. And some of you will have noticed that I'm going to have a hole in the back. Can I show you that? Yes, I've got a hole here where the power supply was. I need to fill that hole in. So I've got a few things to do before we can fit the new motherboard in the case. Right, I've now fitted the I.O. shield for the motherboard and also I've put a piece of black plastic where the power supply was. I did think of putting holes in this ventilation, even fitting a mesh here, but we've got ventilation here and here and there's lots of ventilation holes on the side of this case, so hopefully our passively cooled solution will work in this case without overheating. If it doesn't, I might change what I have in this, uh, this space here. Anyway, let's now fit the motherboard to which I've pre-wired the front panel connectors. I've got a whole video about fitting these. And as I had long wires here, it seemed the best to put them in before I put this in the case because mini ITX cases are always difficult to work in. So let's just get this in place. There we are, always tricky, but it's now pointing out appropriately at the back. So I'll just put in the screws. There we go, and I now need to connect everything up. It's very strange not having a power supply to connect in. And uh, I should just point out, you might have noticed, I have put uh, on the uh, SSD, I put a heat sink on the SSD. That seemed a, a good idea. I got one lying around. Anyway, let me now wire everything else up. And there we are. I think everything is now in. I've connected up the bay in which I'm going to be putting a removable SATA drive for extra storage, but not as a system drive. That's connected to the SATA port. I put in the SATA power lead we saw earlier, connected that in here. I put in a HD audio. I put in a USB 2 port, USB 3 ports on the front panel. It all in theory is in place and pretty neat. So let's put the top back on the case. And there we are. Hopefully, I've now got a totally silent Linux daily driver. Guess what? I've now got my new N100 computer up and running. I've imaged things across from the previous system, and I've even been using it for about an hour or so, doing a bit of email, that type of thing, because when I first booted, the email was there, and then, as you know, you get pulled into email. Anyway, we're now here in the BIOS where I want to show you a few things. Firstly, I want to go across to hardware monitor. Well, you'll see we've got a temperature after running for about an hour or so of what, 56, 57 degrees, something like that. And normally I'd be worrying about a system going much above that, but uh, I know that the T-junction, the maximum temperature allowed at processor die for an M100 is 105 degrees. And uh, it seems going up to a good 70-ish shouldn't be a problem. It's also worth noting is over here under tools, I wanted to point out this, the auto driver installer, which we're starting to see on the ASRock motherboards. And the default for this is enabled and I've disabled it. It was the first thing I did on this system because what this does, it provides the BIOS with direct access to the ethernet port so it can download software. And if you're running Windows, stick it into your system so it boots up and tries to do things for you. I think this is a terribly bad idea. It makes driver installation easier, but really we shouldn't have these online backdoors in our, our BIOSes as far as I'm concerned anyway. So just to let you know about that. I personally would turn that off as I have. Anyway, let's now uh, go out of the BIOS to discard changes, Christopher. Yes, we will and uh, come out like that. And you'll see we'll now boot into Linux Mint. Here we go, it's an ASRock motherboard. We know that, come on, boot into Linux Mint. There we are, and I'll just, uh, fairly simple password there, sorry about that. And uh, here we are in Linux Mint. Things are a bit of a mess because everything's set up for a 1280 by 1024 screen, and we're running here 1920 by 1080, so my desktop doesn't fit and all my icons are in funny positions. But uh, everything's working. There is one issue, which I'll just flag down here, if I can get to down there, there we are. And you can see it says we haven't got appropriate video drivers. And we haven't. And it doesn't matter if I launch the driver manager, because it tells me there isn't a problem, but there clearly is. 
and I know that Linux drivers for the M100 are only available in the very latest kernel. I'm not running that, I need to sort one out. But in practical terms, things are working. I've got a lot going on in my life right now. I'll sort this out a bit later. But uh, other than that, everything is running. We've got uh, everything here. I can play Solitaire. Look, that's good, isn't it? I can play Solitaire and get online. That means the world is uh, going okay. And uh, I can even here run my virtual Windows XP machine like that. If I hit the right place, there it is. Because I like to have this available, particularly for running Office, because I don't like the new version of Office. And Open Office is great, and Google Docs is great, and Online Office is great, but ultimately nothing beats one of the versions of Office from before they started messing it up by putting in a ribbon and things like that. So that's all working. I'm back with a working daily driver. For me, that's all that uh, really matters. And the thing is silent. This said, I'm sure you're interested in performance, and I'm certainly interested in comparative performance relative to the system I've just upgraded from the i3 4330T. So uh, let's just launch a terminal like that, and hopefully I've got something in the buffer. There it is. This is a sysbench command to uh, stress out the CPU factoring prime numbers with a limit of uh, 10,000 events. So let's just run this, and this will give us a number in a second. Shouldn't take it too long. 2.48 seconds it took to run that. And that's a meaningless figure just by itself, but I did run this on the i3 system before I upgraded, and that took 8.27 seconds. So this system is considerably faster than the 10-year-old i3 it has replaced. I also think we should test out the speed of our drives here, or NVMe SSD. Remember, this is PCIe 3.02 lane. We're not gonna get maximum speed, but let's just see what we get. And oh yes, it wants my password, like that. Can't actually identify the drive, which is a bit strange, but never mind. Won't stop us getting a result. And uh, there we are, 1362 megabytes a second, which is not spectacular for an NVMe drive. But again, compared to what I was running previously, I had a system drive that could deliver about 497 megabytes a second. So I have upgraded to a faster system in terms of processor, in terms of drive. It's more modern and it's silent. That is really, really good. Final thing you might be interested in is power use. And if we bring in a power meter that's plugged into the system, we can see we're idling along at about 11 watts. And previously with the i3-4330T, the idle was 31 watts. So this system is uh, almost three times more energy efficient. And I'm sure you're wondering about energy use at load. So uh, let's run up, for example, uh, blenders on here. This is not a system on which you'd run Blender generally, although blenders, often what, a lot of the work in 3D modeling is building things. You can do that on anything, really. You don't need all the graphical stuff for that. But uh, anyway, let's just go and uh, render this. Go up there and uh, render image, and that'll push power use up. Oh yes, up to a 27, 28, 28, 27, something like 28 or 27, what? So uh, that's with the CPU cores maxed out. We saw 29 there, didn't we? But it's always oh, it just got to 30, but uh, something like 30. But uh, anyway, it seems that at load, this system is using about the same power as my previous system at idle. And so there we are. I've upgraded my Linux daily driver to a passively called N100. And already I can tell you that the silence is golden. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.